Hello, this is Dr. Christy Patton Loops, a chemical engineering professor at Missouri S&T. And this video is for Chemical Engineering Thermodynamics 1. We are looking at Chapter 3 in our textbook, which is Volumetric Properties of Pure Fluids. And today we're looking at ideal gases and the ideal gas state. So we say that a substance behaves as an ideal gas, not that it is an ideal gas, those don't exist, but it behaves as an ideal gas when you have all of these things be true. So the phase needs to be a gas. We don't wanna be even a vapor. We wanna be clearly away from the liquid or the solid phases. We also need the molecules to be small and spherical. We're going to treat them as if they are literally just a point. We also need the molecules to be very far apart, which based on them being far apart means that they have no ability to be attracted or repulsed by their neighbors. And if all of those things are true, then the gas will indeed behave as an ideal gas. Now in general, we can expect that that um, it's going to be true for small spherical molecules that are nonpolar. So examples that we might consider would be things like, you know, our O2 and H2 and N2. They're all nice and small and round. Uh, we'll even stretch it to CO, CO2. And there will be a few others that we will occasionally do. Sometimes we'll say ammonia gas, maybe. And all of these, if we are near ambient conditions, so near one atmosphere pressure at roughly room temperature, that that's typically going to be very similar to being like an ideal gas. Now, if we believe that the substance behaves as an ideal gas, then we can use the ideal gas equation of state. Now, you all know this one. This is the Pivnert equation. So frequently we say PV equals NRT. In other classes, in our notation, it would be a V total. And if I'm using the universal gas constant, this equation is correct. But we will also frequently want it on a mass basis. And so I'm going to take this universal gas constant and get a compound specific value of R. Now, unfortunately, in our note or in our book, they don't really distinguish between which of these R's they mean. So you have to look at the units to be able to identify. And so if we're using a mass basis, then PV equals the mass times RT. Or if we want a specific volume or molar volume, we'll use PV equals RT. If we're using the compound specific R with mass, it's going to be specific volume. And if we are using the universal gas constant, then this will be the molar volume. Now, in the ideal gas law, we know that we need to use absolute values uh, or absolute pressure and absolute temperature units. And the value that we're going to end up with for volume is going to depend on what our units were for R. Frequently, we use a modification of this where we consider a closed system. Now, if I have a closed system, N is constant and R is always constant. And so therefore, we end up with PV total equals a constant times T. Or if it's, I can divide through by the mass, a constant times T is P times specific volume. And so therefore, if they are both equal to a constant, I could say this is true for state 1 or for state 2, P1 V1 over T1 is P2 V2 over T2. And this is a really useful variation on the ideal gas law that we'll use often. But again, remember, we're talking about a closed system here. 
Now, there are uh, some things that we've talked about a little bit before. We're going to expand what we know about these. But first, let's talk about the internal energy and enthalpy of an ideal gas. We are just beginning to recognize that all of my properties vary with temperature and pressure. But we have a unique situation when I have an ideal gas or something that behaves as an ideal gas. And that is that for internal energy or for enthalpy, instead of being a function of temperature and pressure or two variables in the state, this is just going to be a function of the temperature. It's independent of the pressure. So both internal energy and enthalpy are functions of temperature only. Now, this is going to be very helpful to us because you'll recall that we've defined our specific heats. And so C sub V is how U changes with temperature at constant volume. But U is a function of temperature only, and so therefore it's just du dt. There is no path constant volume required. And so this is for an ideal gas. And similarly, C sub P we've defined as how H changes with temperature at constant pressure. But again, H is only a function of temperature. So dH of an ideal gas, dT, is an ordinary derivative. Now why does this matter? Because now then, I can rearrange this, du ideal gas is CV dT, and so therefore delta U is the integral from T1 to T2 of CV dT. And I will indicate that I'm requiring these to be for an ideal gas. And similarly, dH for an ideal gas is exactly equal to C sub P dT. Therefore, delta H for an ideal gas is the integral of C sub P dT. All right, so what can we say about work and heat transfer for ideal gases? Now let's consider a material that's behaving as an ideal gas and it's in a closed system that is reversible. If that is true, then dW is negative P dV. And we always have that work plus heat transfer is equal to our change in energy. And if we neglect kinetic and potential energy, we end up with just that piece. And so therefore, typically, we end up with dq is cv dt minus dw. But that is CV dT plus P dV. Okay? Now, let's apply the ideal gas law here. So P is equal to RT over V. All right? And if I do that, RT over V for the P here, then what I end up with is that DQ is equal to CV DT plus RT DV over V. And DW is equal to minus RT dV over V. Now these are true, again, for an ideal gas in a closed system, reversible process, 
and negligible kinetic and potential energy. Okay? But that's actually a fairly broad class of problems. Now the problem is, of course, this is in terms of temperature and volume, and sometimes that's okay, but um, it's actually more common that I know pressure. And so I can replace pressure, well, excuse me, I don't wanna write the root expression for pressure. I can exp replace volume with pressure, so RT over P. And when I plug that in, I end up uh, doing a very similar sort of thing where CP DT minus RT DP over P or dw is minus rt or excuse me that's not right dt minus rdt <clears throat> plus rt dp over p now there are a couple of different ways you can derive this set okay so th these are both true for the same set of equations i can derive <laughs> this by looking at dv equals r over p dt minus rt dp over p squared or i can go with uh, using the original equations where we derived the steady state first law or the special case where um, i have a constant pressure process and we did some relationships there. I can use a similar thing. But this is, I think, the cleaner. But it's still a little bit of messy algebra. But these are generally true. So we'll take a break now in this video. And we'll come back and look at uh, some special cases applying these rules in our next lesson. Thank you very much for your time.